Good evening, everybody. Thank you all for coming. Um, and I, you should thank me, I guess, because this is going to be a great reading. <laughs> it's always this funny thing about thank you for coming as if, you know, it was a burden. It's going to be a pleasure, I promise you. Uh, I, I have a few uh, other events just to, to remind you about. Um, the first is uh, a, a, a poetry event, a special event, that is bringing three Irish poets um, to the UC campus. It's not part of the Holloway series, uh, but it is being sponsored by the English department, along with some other sponsoring academic and units here on campus. Um, and that is on, so next Monday, November 2nd, and it starts at 6 p.m., not at 6.30, the way the Holloway's events do. Uh, but please come, this is an extraordinary opportunity to hear three women Irish poets from several um, aesthetic areas. Uh, I wouldn't say they're representative, three people couldn't be representative of such a rich contemporary poetic scene, um, but it will be really interesting and exciting. Um, of Holloway events that are coming up, um, the next one in, in our series is the special Holloway Poet Reading um, featuring Judith Goldman, and that will be on Tuesday, November 8 at 6.30. Ten days after that is another uh, unusual event, uh, which is featuring eight authors, and I'm one of them, so I won't say that it's going to be fabulous, um, but it's eight authors who together over a period of five years, co-authored a set of ten books uh, recording something of the history of the emergence of the language writing school in the Bay Area. Um, that series is called The Grand Piano, named after the uh, cafe coffee house in the Haight where we used to hang out with a lot of other people, um, a lot of other poets. And this event on November 18 will um, bring eight of those people together in a performance reading. It's like an oratorio scripted from the ten volumes of the, uh, of the grand piano. Um, so come to that. Um, it's not your normal reading. There will be points when numerous of us are, read, are all talking at once. Um, that, so that's November 18, 6.30 here. And then on the last of the series of Holloway events for the fall um, is on Thursday, December 1st, when the poet Anne Waldman will come to Berkeley for a reading with uh, the poet Jocelyn Sadenberg, who's been a part of the Bay Area writing scene for a long time and has given up her library job in order to get her PhD in the comp lit department. So she comes to us under the uh, guise of the grad student poet but she's published like five, six books already. Um, this evening we are presenting work by Claire Marie Stanchek, and I am going to introduce her in just a second. And then uh, the young scholar poet Megan Pugh, who's just finishing her dissertation here in the English department, will do the introduction to the featured guest poet, who is Jean Day. Claire Marie Stanchek is a young Canadian scholar who entered the English department's PhD program to do her graduate work with a strong interest in British Romanticism. That interest, while still abiding, has been somewhat subverted by the distractions of everyday life. Those distractions, however, are not trivial, and Claire Stanchek is probably incapable of being distracted in any way but intensely creatively and with fierce intelligence. The work you will hear her read this evening is from an extended ongoing project that exceeds the limits of any one literary genre and is dedicated to the exploration of everyday life. It is memoir, fiction, journalism, poem. It partakes of documentary invention, cultural geography, textual studies. It has been generated in the wake of walking, eavesdropping, watching, encountering, overhearing, biking, glimpsing, talking, and gazing. The writing is variously aphoristic, scholarly, anecdotal, digressive, imagistic, 
dialogic. The manuscript includes poems, vignettes, conversations, descriptions, memories, comments. Its author records, annotates, observes, transcribes, cites, situation, situates, and always, though she might be abashed, skeptical, amused, stunned, or merely dutifully alert, Claire honors what she encounters. The work, approaching book length now, was begun shortly after Claire moved to Berkeley. As someone for whom Berkeley was a new town and one in a new country, Claire being from Canada, Claire could bring something akin to an anthropologist's attentiveness to bear on the things around her. She also brings to them a poet's sensibility, which is to say alertness to the literal that really is a knitted street post garment, and attunement to the rhythms of perception and the harmonies and sometimes discords that resonate from perception's interplay with what's perceived. The things of interest in this manuscript are quotidian, but for an extremely intelligent and engaged young scholar poet, the quotidian world includes the literary as well as the domestic, texts as well as the streets of Berkeley, Blake as well as Bart and the Bay Bridge. It is premature to speak of the ultimate purport of Claire's project. It is not yet finished. It doesn't even have a title yet, although a possible title, Euclid and Light, has been allowed to float for the last few days, a, a title that I suspect is more to my liking than to Claire's, so it may disappear. But for now, however premature it is for me to characterize the project as a whole, I would say that it is a meditation on the uncanny, on momentary coincidences, unlikely intersections, remarkable though maybe meaningless passings by, instant occasions, and it is a meditation on coincidences that abide. Written out of a sense of wonder, suffused sometimes with melancholy and sometimes with amusement and joy, always reflective of extraordinary intelligence and indefatigable patient attentiveness. Claire Marie Stanchek's quotidian project is held to the present, knowing its obligation to what's in the past and refusing for now to project any demands on the future. It is in this profound, utterly untrivial sense, a book about love. Please welcome Claire Marie Stanchek. Thank you so much, Lynn. Thank you. I found a piece of paper on the ground outside the library. In my mother's handwriting, it said, tell Jim about Friday's absence, photocopy 1P class list for in-class work, get red texts for 1P, absent for posters, absent articles for portfolio. The sunset hour, when light glosses out from inside things. So much did he write in Latin by candlelight that John Milton went blind. Yes, Milton's first poetic allusion to his blindness comes in his sonnet, When I Consider How My Light Is Spent. Yes, a shaggy brown moth flaps against the door. It goes in, I out. Waiting in a shrub-screened driveway, a huge brown-wrapped parcel, a painting, spanned by long arms, the woman resting her cheek against it as I walk past, a piano in an upper window. Berkeley Rose Garden, spiderwebs across my face. Shadow turns person and fear turns shadow, rustling, a snatch of hummed song. Again and again, spiderwebs break across my face and mouth. It is tempting to read the image of the spider and its web in conjunction with epistemological gathering, writes Elizabeth Harvey. Just as the spider's web extends its tactility, allowing it to sense the world around it, so does touch spread itself throughout the body in a system of web-like nerves. Much like a subtle spider which doth sit in middle of her web which spreadeth wide, if aught do touch the utmost thread of it, 
She feels it instantly on every side. I thought of you. Can I stay? I hope you didn't take my spot, Daria. Say of the gulls, let's start with that next time, missing you too, that they are flying, or that the bats have not flowered for years now in the crevice, in the shade of Virginia creepers. Maybe this is something to return to, the sight of blood, the bats, to next time is how, no, Claire, let me. I hope you didn't take me seriously. I don't have an accent. Somebody took my spot and I was like, say of the gulls that they are flying. Life piles up so fast that. The sound of my dog, its claws on the floor. What is your favorite sound? Her key in the door. When Daria died, we were fighting a lot. We were living in such a small place, carrying a box. Her mother called me, no, in the morning. I was flying down every weekend. She was completely different after the radiation. She had to relearn. She forgot how to move her face, how to move her eyes. She would smile if you asked her to. What is your favorite sound? Hey man, do you have an extra cigarette for my dog? He carried the cup of water to me like a child and said, I thought you would find this beautiful. Inside was a drowning moth, flapping dust against sheer walls of glass. A hand from an upper window, water crashing through leaves. And justify the ways of God to men. I hope you slept well last night. At Euclid and Light, a sign for a garage sale has fallen to the ground. A leaf turns on an invisible strand. The yellow-filled pollen look of headlights on the fog coming towards me, the fog cool when I step in. A man in a lit window in white shirt, cell phone to his ear, turns a huge page. Walking closer, I see it is not a page, but the large, clean lid of a box. Transfixed and suspicious in the dark road, I keep walking. Under a street light, I trace the shadow pattern of leaves on my notebook. My hand changes the shadows as I trace. Sailboats on the bay. In the driver's seat of a stalling van, a woman stares solemnly down at the book, a long pencil horizontal across her mouth where the rose would be, a garage with, deep inside, what looks like a fireplace, stacked boxes, a hummingbird in purple flowers. How love removes the world for you, and just as surely when it's going well as when it's going badly, shock doctrine, when you plug in for what N is, I don't know. Did you tell him? I don't know. I guess I'll soldier on without you. My relief at the grapefruit moon, one star shining. Well, I hope we leave our tracks in the sound. You sleep well tonight, do you? I don't know. Do you miss me? I don't. Have you told her? Slug on the road. Red lights in cars like eyes, meaning the alarm is on. A man pulls a mask a grinning skull over his face and straddles his motorcycle. That leaf, still, dangling from the spider web. The smell of sprinklers, then the sight, then the near taste, the wet, mouthy patch of cement. Six car train for Richmond in seven minutes. A boy sits spinning a tennis racket, running shoes, holding the gaze of a stranger, the grind of thought against place, the way hallways have no windows but seem to because the mind is in the room ahead, already looking out. Six car train for Richmond in seven minutes, heavy light in columns on the advertising. On the corner, a man in a wheelchair, warm mist tonight. Sometimes loneliness is a palpable thing, grazing my inner lip the child's sweater in the dark, cool air mixed with the beady mist, bikers with lights down the hill, and uphill, slow, emerging from the fog, a man on a huge bike, a floating bike, floating in, balancing this moment. In the stairwell at night, the light clicks on and makes the fog whirling up and down stairs, 
visible. The cover of Jean Day's 1998 book, The Literal World, features a still from the movie Dead Man, an acid western that stars Johnny Depp as a mild-mannered man from Ohio who is named, wait for it, William Blake. If you've seen the movie, you know that the illusions don't stop there. Other 19th century characters are named after people who weren't even born yet, in a kind of imaginative time travel that's akin to the rich, referential work of Jean Day. Day hops comfortably from the 17th century poet Andrew Marvell to 19th century abolitionist Frederick Douglass to the 20th century phenomenologist Maurice Merleau-Ponty. Just reading the notes to her 2006 book Enthusiasm, Odes and Odium is thrilling to say nothing of the poems. Well, the poems are thrilling too. Elsewhere, she invites comparison between research and stunt work, and that seems right in the best of ways. In the still days chosen from Dead Man, we see Mr. Blake from behind, staring out at a frontier town. I can't help wondering if this town is similar to the place Day starts, Enthusiasm, Odes and Odium, a town with the wonderful name of Dudesville. Day has written that she's interested in America, which she calls the place underfoot. In Dudesville, we aren't just underfoot, we're underground. An I and a you are buried in dresses up to our waists like plants, and we hear the strains of a tantalizingly garbled America the Beautiful, rolling in rustic, not to say sea, not to be shining, waves. Day gives us no comfortable patriotic platitudes. The nation, among a great many other things, is at issue. Some 20 pages later in the poem, Riot and Axiom, she writes, life is a ball, I begin, e pluribus, on a bus. She invokes the beginning of the motto we know from America's currency, out of many, one, but she only gives us half of that motto. After the many, she slides via a kind of auditory pun to on a bus. And that can't stand for money, many. And in fact, they seem suspicious of anything as totalizing as the one. She prefers the particular, the detail, the particle, the droplet. E pluribus unum isn't the only thing Day keeps incomplete. Incompletion is an aesthetic and indeed a political goal. Day's language is constantly modifying itself so that as soon as you start to think you've grasped a meaning, that meaning changes. Ron Selleman compared her poems to Faulkner for the 22nd century, a description I quite like. But another useful way into the poems comes from one of Day's own phrases, a parliament of lines. That quote comes from a series called Undersong, which was recently published in Cambridge Literary Review, and it gets us back to that idea of a representative body that can stand for the many, but hopefully as a parliament without becoming the monolithic one. Undersong is a rich and beautiful set of poems, and it's also funny in moments. Twice, Day inserts the parenthetical, if you're into it, and in the final section she changes it to, I could tell you weren't into it. No, I wanted to respond when I read this, I am. <laughs> and so here I'm just gonna quote the ending of that poem. Try always when you look at a form to see not a warning from your heart, but a dunce in a luminary's hat, waiting for a table on which to get serious about the liberal of the species. It's a wise and funnily self-deprecating warning, but Jean Day's work, modesty aside, is illuminating and it's time to get serious. Please join me in welcoming Jean Day. Uh, that was really nice, Megan. And um, is this okay? Can people hear me and no echo? And Well, I'm really glad you mentioned Dudeville. where the boys are. One can only wonder where the boys are and why, ears up close to the speakers, 
in line for summer haircuts against pounds of winter wool per Nietzschean party and back. Are they sleeping in church? Dogs of the sun bracket what one can accrue without allegory at the very least. Folk wisdom carries who's to say and to whom. There are mysteries and there are riddles. The timid chuckle gently into their jabot and the big guns go off slap happily in the sanctuary for homo erectus. One can only skim neuropathetically into the path of the coming wave, mimulus answering by species name, lotus facing into the swell. Bikini goes epopped, if it goes at all, in an uncategorized breeze, and the band doesn't come on until later, when rollers pound a beach with a young Helen Mirren naked in it. Where the boys are, too. And when do we get paid? It's true, I never take you anywhere the other boys have been, though there's a party and an after party on the corner every night. Anyway, we were all trying not to have jobs, getting massages on Medi-Cal with a kind of relief bordering on anxiety, the metric of which looked like the skyline of any eponymous city, Oklahoma, Sioux, Sodder, or simplicity itself, and expressed on a stretcher strewn with fine sand and corn dandies arranged in an easy cipher. It's all scratch, hence my head wrap heterospecific on the way, uninvited to the after-hours club, we continue the squabble over who will take the first watch and who the last. Then we climb the ropes to the top of the hill to see over. Where the boys are, three. The empathy of non-identity could be taken for friendship among monopods. Not that they would call it such as carries a ball through the air under shadow of hawk, before hawk wheels in to the open, palm of one morning, waiting for a subject. Gone now, the crisis of boredom laid at someone else's feet. Where the boys are for? How many exactly? One for the end of the chorus, huh? One for the soldier of fortune, huh? One slain by Virago mom over the fence, huh? One the straight man, one the scapegoat, ha huh, ha. Huh. One for the road. Take this hammer. Send it in search of more hammers. The zeros on the ends of future days do their best merely to confirm that the big fish staring me in the face is not the first line of Moby Dick. Where the boys are, five. If blue continues, one can hardly pass unnoticed by the somewhat dead snake in the grass, a form of freedom academic to a nitwit who daily contracts with herself to inhabit a fiction without sting. We should be so lucky to pass without incident under radar writ large over small potatoes. When the wasp takes up the position, eager to distance itself from pain, his excellency delights in the phrase, arboreal being as being low to the ground, one can hardly pass without regret. Where the boys are six, are they striving or just getting off? I hesitate to think knowing the dog of my father's boss. It will come as no surprise, now or ever, that we have lashed the boats too tightly together. See, one droops while the other rises, while the sisters see to the jelly and the workers ask nothing much in return for their labor, becoming more and more convinced that my friend with the poker face turns it blankly toward a poisoned person's pension, the quotient I lack, or something for the crows to be on about. Where the boys are, seven. Island corn. And that's all I have to say. 
Voltaire especially attempted witty physics with a whiff of ringing the last from a jug of liquor, the rube at the clam bake sniffs up his sleeve, and a gull gulls go-go to go fight Estragon's battles. Be not afraid, if you are blessed in this way, by the incense in the censers of the censers. Take it to the top, by way of baggy wrinkle lower down. This is where the clowns live, are not funny. Where the boys are, eight. Until you come to the end, until you've seen what I've seen, it's Rashomon all over again, for the women will report prolonged elastic enjoyment in toy camera operations. For the men in the documents, thinking is burning at the edges of the weeds that have been whacked, in the sacking of Annapolis by all that is great, in an almanac ropey in retrospect of having sopped up the mess or stopped a do door solidly from closing so the children of corn can worship their seed certain that the longer a person remains a child, the older he or she will live to behold wonders. Where the boys are, nine. Door shut. The kids can only take adults for operatives. Bird hides in hedge. Nervous business interrupt us. In slipstreams silk, the contraption for love unfolds on a map of the world, hot spots numbered. Whereas Bonds got his ass pretty much covered, tessellated life list and all. Somewheres you can still hear the corn grow tassels and the worm turn. The thrill is gone, 1969. Where the boys are, 10. Where is Brunhilde? Where is Siegfried? Eating mashed peas in a genial dream time by the falling waters of courtesy? It came to them to express their tears by the bushel bucket after watching the films of Kiarostami, who put the flicker in their faces. In that epic, there was part one, and there was the one who came first to the party, rolling a little ball along with their pet spot, a hell of a horse. But there was insufficient ore or oil in the story, and so he said, don't go there. Just make a tear appear and follow the light. Who put the soul in the body? The body eats the soul. Nor should the balls be symmetrical or in any way equal if you want children to juggle in the future. Let it be said that a rising tide floats all balls, Tidy vessels for one bloody nose, one bout of syncope, one hysterical fit, one dialogue with God. That's only half a regulation set. The subsequent luncheon is not a meal, but an event. Teeth grinding to stumps over the grit in the cake. Our thumbs may recover from the crises of the gods, but our tails forever entertain us. So that was my most recent project. And I'm going to continue um, with something a, a bit older um, from an unpublished manuscript called Daydream. It's called Works and Days. And the title comes from um, the fact that I was working with this idea of each poem being, in some sense, a single day, and thinking a little bit about um, the Hesiod poem, which I don't uh, know well. Um, and then as I began to, to work on this, um, I was editing something about um, a series of etchings by Hogarth called Industry and Idleness. And there are the 12 etchings, which are the, like the moral progress of um, a bad guy and a good guy, or a, a, a lazy guy and a, an industrious guy. Um, and these are hilarious, and I was going to try to show them tonight, but um, didn't quite get that together. Um, works and days, industry and idleness.
Thus, to a wonderful degree, will the organ of cliché beat lush on the tips of complicity's itch with upper management. Why are those trees waving high on the fluky onset of rain? Your horse in a pasture, extenuating, others are working, the mood is churchy, light is the most pleasant and gladdening of things, interrupted by dinner, lunch, and not just this one, by fingering trees, by susceptibility to some version of narcolepsy, when we are probably on the verge of great things, which is to say troubling to shake, shoulder, the collective guilt of non-suffering, a cow's tail swatting in successive J's and S's, eunoic, a hand gesture, the sincerity function of which cancels city fog or its foliage delicately tossing. Yet where would I, you, be in the restless night town without language? It will rain tomorrow, too, when you are at your loom, unapocalyptic, but earnest as aimless green ooze pursues the empty night of the self without object. Here is the platoon of signature gatherers, woolly scud, each an objection of your better hand. You might abjure the sign on the boss's tent, but the finger points to what a head seems to need, a leash or shelter, somewhere to go to complain, an amphitheater, say, where everyone's ashamed and eager to confess. The name of the little city on the desert over the hill glows, so cowpokes and motorists can't miss its big opportunity. The promise of Starbucks in Boomtown, where as yet only the wall's ATM applies. So what if we were out for adventure? Did it have to add up to a blot on the sun? May you inherit a casino of a million rooms and find yourself one whose potential is pitch, proclivity light in the saddle. You are clearly not awake, said the road to the metatarsal. Heard the bird on my day off. But that was about as musical as I could get in the near-dead Toyota, in which we prefer to hold court or proceed in a seedier vein. These days of the manufactured soul query the one in a hurry to do the right thing with the imponderability of a detached limb blown by the wind all afternoon. You and your 100 poems cash out at the bar of experience soothed by an electric waterfall, sediment of the wild current staining the glass as light follows upon your swell and ebb, projecting into tomorrow's plot or cue for fall. And I follow, eager at the sidewalk's shore. But that's just it. I couldn't hold still to wait for the vaporish, calm cloud clusters to part for two black oyster catchers. Not that my abstinence has helped in any way. I try not to want what you want, a sleep not mine, but the kind you pay for, empty of black but full of green, as at a bend in the road where the hill is a pillow and our separate synchronized accounts. The hills, by the way, have eyes filled with images of dales whose resident birds pontificate on a great many topics. As always, we arrive by boat, but suck at the tit of other options, as do chicks in a dark corral or soft aspirations lobbed into the opposing center fielder's glove. Haven't we all parsed the wonderful totem, crocodile, penis, bird, breast? Jailbait, maybe not, but my yielding changes everything, nested indoors where I am, of course, inconveniently naked, although this lends a certain amorousness to the official sensorium. In our clamor for action, we were necessarily on the verge of great things, not things as they are, but things elastic. I was telling someone about going out with the guy with big hair, to begin at the beginning, to a club in Dayton, after which, thumbing the dark interstate, it wouldn't be the first time. We only feared getting so far with this, thus, not machines of living correctly, but bods or bits that should have been perfect 
at least as morning happinesses that might spin out nearly all day. You'll remember keeping those feelings in play, ear to the far, bucked up on venison and pie, having heard it said by those in neighboring trucks, trees, we'll eat you for breakfast without a trace of hurry. Is that what you tell yourself? with difficulty orienting self to sun? The demonstration of love, whose object I am, involves a discrepancy, occasion for laughs, according to Ray, eluded in sleep, whenever sleep does not elude us. It was a great day when you detailed the practices of your people. But do those habits endure when what I see conceals from me the blip on your arterial spot? as if there were no such thing as subclinical vernacular. In the driveway, crows joke in Gollum's rasp, sentimental, no doubt, over this year's gross of acorns. But have we not asked that question? Are you the man I am? Of the person in spandex, kept under wraps as distinctly uncool for one who, not yet solo, will join us any minute on the pavement. So much of flowering is imitation. Exactly where now meets its seedier self, which is what it was and is, regardless of intention. Day's attachments unpeel just when we hold all the oranges suspended for later judgment, to begin at the ending, etc. A photo hangs us by a hair from a generation of wishful and somewhat attractive humans, none of whom seem to expect a reckoning on the point of sun's decline over a strung out leaf. But here we all are together, waiting for orders on the breath of a warm accordion. No exegesis buoys the falling sensation as great balloons greet the arrival of a neighbor's new human or can quite satisfy the puncture of pedestrian afternoon. Relax, the family dog will always be Bonnie. As it were in retrospect, the rather dirty wedding guests crowd against glass in the anteroom of the psychic, astonished at the connection between sky and its absorption, restlessly nursed by the queen of faculties according to Baudelaire. What will we expect of them, if not realism now, in the ashy fin to this morning's preposition? Reader, honey, I can't do it for you. Embrace the great sands of content, robust in your nimble coat, and toast to simple thirst. Camels, stop showing off, say the writers for Stephen Colbert. If we're aghast, let's gush on all the above. Gamble Sunday away, momentarily backlit, glassy. What's new? I hate that question. In the bosom of the friend of language, but you interrupt, fresh from Gotham, with a shit-eating grin on your face, it's a happy face displaying the warmth of the world of brides and their tins and the utopian projects of intimists I've known. So at last it's too early to throw up huts for the rejected among us, too late for closure, too lean for habiliment of any kind. Face it, you'll never understand the leer of the mother of the laboring collars, since it's she who situates, heinous, horrible, your place in line, for the privilege of taking one more croupy breath. There are firefighters and alphabeticals, bliss queens armed to the eyeballs with calm. Can they cover for me? Can Z's outpouring summon A's in breathing, if only through the nose? Is this what they call automatic pilot? There is no other subject. And if situated, would the pilgrim still have to cool her heels at the sill of the painting excluded and anyhow lost? The host, making off with my coat, 
would coolly send me in to the Babylonian spread, but the next thing would have no bearing on its nub, adding up merely to glass tinkling in the kitchen, or would that be trees sucking liquids counterfactual to their droop? Generously a snowball hangs fire. Boomerangs instead, you say, in that case, you guess you'd set your chin at the mirror, and in imitation, so would I, though it's against a log in literary time. I understand myself to be leaning. I hate the weakest hour and mistake the meaning of embouchure for bedtime lush. But you've arrived mouthless from the ground in something loose the racers go for, New Year's Day 2008. It's a morning thing. You were its reveille, slipped into a description of allegory by way of Venus and Cupid. Whereas I, erotic if not exactly swift, was I not the glove whose hand you shook? Bushy and right as cumulonimbus on the double negative. In your face, arriving bike aloft, calm would reign in the placid days of viewing art. I apologize for the analgesic shot that stages down by the river as its refrain. The moment would naturally twang, entangled in its own manufacture. One has good days and bad. This one's just a B on the A. You have yesterday's rhymed rain over distant, but we remind ourselves real suffering elsewhere, where reading helpful literature is beside the point. My claim is no more calm than a small mollusk under siege. Do my atoms kibitz even now? The keel we are planing is uneven. We run out into vegetable night as if it were glue, and calling it so would back up other assumptions, but nothing could be further from the fact, however severed from value. When some of us engage in the therapy of names, there is a pause before others send up a blood-soaked blanket, Bigfoot in death, surrendering to the kernels of this our wax, who were never in charge in the first place. The sound of her mantra was really nothing more than a murky wail turning turmoil from liquid to solid to stand it on its head. That would be your mother. One is the subject of her you betcha blare through which a door makes possible your entrance haphazard, attentionless yet it's the return that returns, not you or her purse. After all, you were sent to see, I must remember to be glad or when a ray of sun's brilliance hypotenizes my gigantic back-turned hand crusted with dirt. It mistakes its own labor for other hands. No, it mistakes its own labor for art. <laughs> other hands say they would be happier studying in trees where presumably no one hears old lumber sleep or the cry of new rope in anyone's lazarette. The piano is being practiced. I am in the middle of everything. August assembles willing materials, writes winter rain, or would that be, to begin again, coffee or infant fantasy, both brisk. In an otherwise eventless hour, I am still alive. You have bought a box of wood, but our straits are not yet so reduced. Either way, we refuse development bite off more jerky than we can chew. Bow the air, apparent. If nothing else, the 12 tones have brought us face to face with a misplaced sympathy for beautiful problems, which arise as toughened thought balloons dropped on men toasting the old regime and its rare stimulants. They were like senators, but no more deplorable than anyone else. So go on foot, young aunt, to the bicycle race. It will rain tomorrow, but today has its own refrain. No stiff can ride, Sally.
this unfurling for us, no handsome foil or proffer of snippable imminence. In the mild chill of February, one Walenda will overreach on faith alone. Those of us in pews will chant the saying scene, taking lines at random to suit ourselves as club sandwiches are divvied up and before the old stump floor shines for the hoot nanny and output of the chairs unfolded. Fool, ant, LA, over a bridge whose guy wires may not care to hold in their hurry to please and feeling green for stillness. Two black oyster catchers cancel their checks and exit. We've lived long enough, more than once, to see them snoop among the rocks where headlights dimple the suffing backwash of local color soured of experience. If plot wants me to rein in its disregard for future fixtures, I'll meet you wherever you suggest. It's a cup of something ugly we're up against. Rain black trees resign their sullen art in favor of willing, ever upward pointing, as we do our overdetermined homeward. I intended all along to break the spell. Then raging spoke the gatherer of clouds, regardless of my opinion. Blind Orion, eager for the sun, finds the argument over sex pathetic as he lumbers with great affection for yesterday, clearing the treetops of their rustling dirty talk. Meanwhile, Diana, leaning on a cloud, forms the vague idea of revenge. Business abroad is always insecure. If her ox were mine, I would ride it, away from all assholes, clop, clop to the gallows, to account at last for my productions. Shadowing that giant, little addicted to his own defense. A facial tick before the bluer of his own black eyes cues thundercloud in turn to block the healing ray. We have seen the tip of the iceberg pawed the ground. As day swallows itself whole, it's hard enough to see the optical effects of crystal ice in the deck of clouds under which I sewed without thumb in any handbook. How can I say my children grow as pillars of the sun here when you are so the limit of my composition? The old saw learns new licks in a bold barn where girls give in to their abandon. Thus, the left margin makes a haven safe for pearls before dinner, swine before weather, and to what grosser end? As unwise as it is to sow your seed after a funeral, let it not be thought, I lack the means for comedy. That this floating toy is produced in a factory overseas finds handlers and their fathers pale. Here the argument breaks into per perverse little licks. Roll along, O oh sick moon, as your oarsmen pull, so you founder, doing nothing to dispute the dogged pursuit of pleasantness. F, as in Frank, pulling on his filthy boots, never any good at repartee, would ripen the corn given the chance and so offset the dollars fall free. Maybe the broken hand does nothing to forestall a line of thought composed in syntactical reverse over amber waves, seeing the pearled eclipse of our talc white faces, every form of order has some degree of life. You who eat mantras and moths share late night green with the demon heads of state we so love to ogle. What is green after all without its many fingered red or magic bondo for the reattachment of supernumerary limbs? No one can do the job for us immersed as we are now, more than ever before, 
in the teachable moment of a tongueable crowd lapping at the heels of two dirty brides in one stone planted midstream under the rubric of what will come to be rustic in clouds. We are what we say. That tomorrow, says Isaiah, was yesterday. In my midnight confession, the freeway pulls its little spurs of light into the mangle. Quo is where the bucket stops, as if to cut off at the knees. Who is the unencumbered other subject at the spigot? Difference being the one thing we crave, but cannot bear. Oh, the reader doesn't know. Now show me the length of your legs. I'll show you my hands hard candy dangled in space, having dropped a stick into the instant cleavage, green on the edge of your throughway dalliance with frozen thisbe. Did she say, even metaphorically, it was a matter of truth? All the figures one can see act their part in relation to a squall that sweeps them along side symmetry. Atoyat. That's Toyota backwards. <laughs> Delighting the eyes against cobalt, and oak delimits the way I myself feel about the ability to stand two-footed and subject to sway in the way of all days written up in smoke. I thought I would know its moment on my tongue, but who does? So this is flag day, and the crisis is technical, aimed at all who answer to junior when the bugle honks. A Freddie Wren thinks of herself in the first person middle initial, quick check of tail and zero embarrassment. Where would we be without lemon heads and red hots? In verse. But you must have come from very far away to believe that. Like a foreign cucumber, you could thrive in a cave if you had to, or certainly exist, but there would still be the overwintering problem of telling time back to me barely alert to enjambment from without, even when spring comes, down in spades from the mountains. But what am I saying that hasn't been seen in a teardrop? Return to your workroom, backyard, dusk spliced to the brawl of upset species. One sings for a concerted few, or would that be three, bees working tirelessly to arrange threads of spit on Fipple's flute. A strand is a bit of rope. The rope is attached to the harpoon. Are we not whales when the sun goes down? The problem is not the middle, but a filament no doubt spun during the night from the thick mouthpiece of a dame asleep at her desk in her dome corollarily when awake making and displacing her works for voice. In plain desert dusk, a second saint concerns her himself with the slow cure of resins, polyesters, hardened to attract in the manufacture of spars. Any sail, why skirt the flank whose ankles dangle from this romance of the momentarily skilled? Most of every day flows flat, though the patriarch of Lower Thames repeats this street has always been two-way. Though the family recycles the damnedest things, they have made a desert peaceful whose shit is last to depart. After I've Googled your name, instinct concludes that the penis then had a fluted shape, like a seaweed or polyp, unmediated by the rest of the feeling body or its concepts we would be glad to do it again. I think, in fact, oh, yearbook in which Oblamov will never dress. Page open to reveal the fate of that shape, assuming the harpoon can't change its mind in mid-wing as a spring-loaded elevator drops, certainly, just at your floor. You are the self-recording tome stalled in the dead zone. Sea scientists sleep off, one anemone at a time fingerettes uncurling. Would that be so-called elephants or arguments 
all the way down. Back to the oak, rising like a mast, radically out of true to, to scratch Orion's belt in the do-nothing days before school starts. Our howdy-doody asses, no, it's just a vertical gash holding its noose over a yellow-bellied sapsucker, itself mouthing a thread platonically. Chimneys used to prick the factory sky, but what will become of us now that we've sent the do-gooder away? The sun empties itself into the bride of day in night, where all themes converge. We should have scheduled such a thing. We should have scheduled such a thing for today, but instead it looks directly at us, whatever it is, because day wouldn't be done without it. Oops. So I was going to read one more series that is not as long as that. Called Low Life. And the title comes from um, a book called um, well, the title is astonishingly long. It's called Low Life, or one, one Half of the World Knows Not How the Other Half Live, being a critical account of what is transacted by people of almost all religions, nations, circumstances, and sizes of understanding in the 24 hours between Saturday night and Monday morning in a true description of a Sunday as it is usually spent with the bills of morality calculated for the 21st of June with an address to the ingenious and ingenuous Mr. Hogarth. Uh, my lo low life is uh, much shorter than that book. It's uh, 21 poems of 21 lines each. After the experiment of the streak of the street, a blast winds a face in its own scarf and pages sail off in the general dust-up. Now how can we nail what's risible in a star rising over a stair? A cock walking down the block, statistics being what they are nuts about. Someone in the neighborhood will anyway finger the perp in the lineup, noting in a to-go cup that nothing is everything, from genome to rice, fruit cart, to counterfactual intelligence. Now we're getting somewhere. And sir, you may depend upon its anti-name. Noting in a to-go cup the augury of momentaneous emotionalizing, we have a day yet left to make it right for our followers having followed us into this mess, time being linear on a circular set. The ditch inspector finds a tavern likely for segues from clockwise to written account. A donkey retired by a blow to the head. We will be the same, neckerchiefs or no, for the nobodies will want to resist affiliation. It's like bombolating. The, tr the bees persevere in thinking themselves handy. We will be the same by the wax log fire. The same, returning to writing from bad sleep. The simple same, unrested among our helmeted cohort, getting nowhere fast. And the same coming in from a walk by nature valued and valuable. As human industry, regardless of output, I accept that we are flying, so going on credit, if representable at all. The creek meanders, the revenuers snoop around, the hand instructs the eye, my goose is cooked but recursive is the deep, dank shade of leaf fall. It won't be a stylish marriage. As human industry regardless regards us, panhandling from a textbook to get the feel of our fingering weight relative to what we undertake or have already taken, 
having summoned our friends from the public house, Hofbrau, we have survived the double talk of spring, when all we have is rain. What's left then to our dangerousness as agents? Dinged sincerity? Glumly, we watch the House go to the Republicans. It's not like we're such fantastic Democrats. <laughs> Scooting along on my nightdress, I liberate the urchin, call him infant. Fantastic Democrats are like us denizens of a middle world, moms and dads cut away to umbrellas and ants, of whom all are familiar with the annals of bad days when the water may rise and one may look gently on one's unread books. Let me just get these hoes up over my face since we're rolling back the stock of New Deal boats. A cradle in that shape rocks a nautical child soon standing in the pool of her own pantaloons where analogy is concerned and the analgesic husband like an opposable thumb <laughs> closes over that part of the brain in need of fingers. And one may look gently on all who tell the tale, wholly or in parts, and all who, hour by hour, run fingers along the names of those they'd bed and those dead while dancing with a mop. This is all there is, and all there is of this. Yet shall we quail with the silly birds, whose legs in flight shoot pencil-like from their rumps? Or wake with a start and a stifled yell? We'll compete for food and suitable mates, shivering while we wait for the police to tell us we have been let go. We have been let go with the silly birds, one Dabney and one Orison of Iris. You who see the moon in your brother's face and laugh, you were the best present of all, encased in honey, wax, and silk, stuck to my simple socks, drying by the fire. Low tide brings sand up a willow dell, but which is worse or worser, the mnemonics of the thing or meconium stiffening into dusk? A pant legs caught in gorse in the course of readying ourselves for you. The landscape parts operatically like pupae in a papal state. A willow dell is one among many silly buds, detachable, inedible facts that are not all that difficult to imagine. Like Bonhami, with a name like that, I could take it all back to Texas and the music we were born to ramble from, though where I'd find the time is hard to say. In a conversation, a pause that musically you'd like to fill, but can't. In the event, in the city, in fond remembrance of a horse's mouth and what goes on there. In the city, what goes on goes on, and sooner or later, your legs shoot out from under you in a state of naked grace. They are there for the goose or any coroner or wifely duty done. It would be one of the hours 21 where we to yammer less would tell us why, where, when, and how the howl described as relief accrues to the more or less sequential suffering of a day, loitering to the tax, daring the ax, a little spit and he was in, beyond the pale of the changing shift, paid to the crow of the cock called Shorty. And sooner or later, we return to the working dream, the alpha talk of beta waving, because we had to flee political arithmetic and did, so becoming classic in the end, our beautiful poverty, its square feet and features, all original art left as instruction for our successors to cash instanter. If the rich be a barrier reef to a sister, if every kind of sweet trips the endorphin response to reading, it's all I've ever dreamed of. And did 
And did my rush to explain, explain my hurry to live? The massive mounded cover of cloud moved against the idea of privately printed sand, a blast but one in the hand over the flow of two in capital at this particular address. We feed and sleep. The temptation to overstate dogs the demand for much of what we offer, running water from a fantastic fountain of four or 50 rivers to your thirsty face, capitalized in the romance of everyday life. And here I must be slapped. For much of what we offer takes the shape of energy drunk by a driver on the way to a pickup rendezvous for she who, like the poorest he that is in England, hears the crowd's applause to the highest bidder to her kidnap, press, or nab, fated finds the going easier, head down, underwater there, a man so easily alights in his circular tent, time being lunar or kinder to a twofer than it is to a hoofer on hind legs about to pre-register for the auto da fe. Head down, the crowd applauds from the mills to the textile gins, for example, in funicular or furnace. My orthography gets away from me as smoke pours from hamstrung multi-story embassies. The tide stretches idly across the stink of feet belonging to me or some one of the Lazzaroni, looking up from last known depths those antinomian suspects caught out in the sun of Egypt everywhere. Sooner or later, the square will clear. The eligibles will stand out. From last known depths, Hugo retreats to a shop window. And from there, the glare of an exceptionless day stalls light pursuit in bouts of verbiage. You live here? It's an impertinent question to one on the run. In Fixie Town, where pastry cues are perfectly Soviet. Don't glare at me from your shop window, honey. I'm hungry for the fruit of Bouvard and the OCD of Pécuchet. I just need to get away. What you will, will be OK. In Fixie Town, where I was born, post-lapsarian trains let fly, and the horns of the excited jackals wax self-referential having spelled the numbers exactly right, left on the street where you live. Are we only on our way to the obelisk to find dull there, hunched over a one-pot meal? It's real. What goes up must come back, as a man changed on a municipal map to something new enough, though still arrayed in a torn and likely vintage chemise. Where you live, where I was born, we call everybody darlin, with only mild affectation. Friction being a mechanical secretion at this point in the story, when youth is deflowered by a seedy old lion who just happens along from his forest primeval. What resistance when golden pollen sprays slow off the ax, the ax having gashed from anus to heaven. And there were we, the old lady and me, Wondering the way to the big box store, there to deflower others like us or a potential series of this kind. From anus to heaven ad infinitum. Fifty years of labor relations rust to scatter in the matter of the mother, new to sleep but getting the job done shouldering what's left of the sky over Dearborn's new without the pert smile of service rendered sensitive to tinnitus for the rest of us. I love the wheel and that is all, said Paul, holding his ears to face his face against youth devoured in oncoming cars. Not that by then they'd be any less stars. What's left of the sky when night falls and maybe a hundred of us gather to witness the figment of my anguish in the officer holding his ass up to his ears 
clearing his throat of a certain cheerful vulgarity. None should take offense, though Pauline stoops and the officer fingers the knob in the very place where orthogonals converge at the barricades of absolute disaster, coming after chords, lyric and vocal. Daisy, Daisy, unfurled at a safe enough distance. And vocal, that is, dying to be written, in the killer imperative of the GPS, we exit the elephant already in a snit to beat the band that waits at the kiosk around the corner where my message will be posted in a future torn from hot bacon and beans. We alight on our wagons, warm kids in tow. People all over the world, everybody, join hands, join, start a love train. And what this has to do with cartography before the horse finds a frontier to halt at. Just go to edit and press undo. The love train had no idea it would end here. Least Algonquin, last American in a fit of health, sighed in a haystack for a to-go needle. No one could count and none did the red corpuscles tied nightly to women who fussed and cared. Perhaps the podiatrist would wander in here and relieve us of having nowhere to go to, but perhaps not after the lapse of hither into thither, only to realize we were not even close. We were not even close. Daihatsu Jetsam sailed on nuclear steam of course, there's no such thing as thought streaming from the earbuds of those in distress. In this sense, we're all managers, fleshy bodies of fishes larger than a lion supreme, paw raised like a hood ornament in mid-stride salute, can suffer, though the door closes after us, never cut to a door. The great little dictator remains poised in the needler's art, clueless, as to what we were and what we were up against. Thank you very much. Thank you, Claire Marie Stanchek. Thank you, Jean Day for a great reading. Um, hang out a bit. Um, the bookstore has provided copies of Jean's books for you to look at or to purchase. Um, and thanks again for coming.